Welcome to Uncage. Today we're speaking with Lawana Johnson. Lawana is the founder and principal of Lawana Johnson Leadership and Development Group. We are going to talk a lot about leadership. We're going to talk about all of the things that are associated with making good leaders, being a good leader, and uh, I'd say kind of maintaining good leadership. But uh, before we get there, Lawana, tell us a little bit about you and your career. Thank you, Ben. And this uh, first things first, and this may see a, seem like a little bit of a side, but I have to say that I am the daughter of Arthur Ray Lachlan and Minnie Emma English and the um, paternal granddaughter of JV and Clara Lachlan and the maternal granddaughter of Eugene and Clara um, English. And so telling you who I am and what my career is about is really rooted in the history and the stories of my parents and my grandparents, my ancestors, um, who endured so much so that I could be here and actually have um, a, aspired to a leadership role. And so culture and family is really a big part of my story and has fueled the tra trajectory of my, uh, what I would call eclectic and expansive career. So um, I will go sort of way back, but I haven't had a lot of different roles. Um, mm -hmm. I first, I, I, my first professional um, position out of college was I was recruited by rental, Enterprise Rental Car uh, as a management <laughs> trainee, and I I moved to LA and I was working in West Hollywood. And the reason I want to go back to Enterprise is because I think the business acumen that I learned from Enterprise, I still rely on and utilize today. Wow. You know, the business model that Enterprise had, uh, especially back then, and wasn't just a, a rental car company. They were a replacement car company. And so the, the skills that I learned in that management program from marketing to sales and um, and and all of the things really, um, I look back on often some of those things that I learned. And um, and so then uh, after that, I, I realized that maybe that wasn't quite the right mix for me. I was excellent at that job. Actually, I, I got to do lots of monthly um, dinners with the vice president. He would hold these monthly dinners for top performers. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the 10 or 12 people often in those rooms because I, I really learned it very quickly and was good at it. And so then I went, you know, you know, as life happens, my father died and I decided to go back home and I I started working as a health educator, something totally different. The dean from my school had suggested I try out this health educator position, and I started working um, at Planned Parenthood of Arizona and eventually um, became the director of education and training and was then thrust into this senior leadership position, um, leading the strategic direction of a pretty large nonprofit organization um, and uh, in my late 20s. And so wow. then had uh, 14 staff, seven of them were teams that I had, I had created team positions. I also got the board to create the first teen board position. Wow. And I had 20 teen advisory group members, and we were doing this big social marketing campaign um, and also had a global partnership with a, an organization in El Salvador training young people and having this youth exchange. So that was like sort of a, at that age, I look back on it and I, I, uh, I, I learned so many things. I was just thrust yeah. into this leadership position and had to hit the ground running. And so um, fast forward, I was, re I was, I, they like to say I was poached from, um, from there to uh, Seattle to work for an mm -hmm. organization that was then called Center for Health Training is now um, Cardia Services. And I, I tell you, I went from the minor leagues to the major leagues on that one. Because <laughs> all of a sudden I was working for this training organization, hiring and utilizing numerous, you know, multiple consultants and managing projects across the region and the country. And, um, you know, meeting people on the national level in social service and, um, you know, from the CDC to the Office of Population Affairs and all of wow. those organizations. And so um, a lot of what I was doing, and it was supporting organizations, nonprofit organizations, schools, community health clinics on um, 
on improving their their client services, improving their programs, mm -hmm. um, learning how to serve communities better, especially those uh, marginalized communities and communities right. of color. And so uh, I was doing assessments and training and capacity building and um, eventually really found that I, I had a niche for um, I had uh, for leadership and mm -hmm. helping um, mid-level mostly um, at that time leaders on how to how to be better supervisors, how to yeah. how to manage staff, how to communicate effectively, how to give and receive feedback. Um, and then at the executive level, eventually um, strategic planning, how do you mm. uh, make sure you're serving your clients well? Um, what do your staff need? Those kinds of things. And and then about 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, I decided to leave. Um, I'd started a family and needed some more time freedom and yeah. started consulting and doing a lot of what I was still doing. All of the things I sort of brought along with me, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it sounds like one, you stepped into leadership roles. You've done a wide variety of things. You did exactly what I tell every young person, which is take every opportunity. As crazy as it may sound, you just got to go for it and you'll figure it out. And now you are at Lawana Johnson Leadership and Development Group. Yes. And I know you're working on a lot of interesting stuff. So tell me a little bit about what's the latest with the group. Yeah, the latest that I'm working on, I actually got a small business grant, just got it. And um, to create- Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Over the summer, I really want to stop and pause and say, what impact do I really want to make, right? What am I trying to do next in the world? I've done mm -hmm. all these things. I've had lots of experience. And so I then had this vision for um, creating um, a Black Executive Leadership Academy and to support new and emerging Black leaders and help them learn the skills and the knowledge and how to um, sort of navigate uh, those executive leadership roles. That's one track. And then the second track is actually to, um, to develop board members. So mm. my mission and my goal and my passion moving forward is to integrate the nonprofit C-suite and integrate the... Um, reintegrate the 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 nonprofit boardrooms because mm -hmm. over the last few years I've been serving as an interim executive director um, for three different organizations. And one of the things I've learned, which you know I had a sense of, but really, really learned is that um black leaders are often really off isolated and mm -hmm. that I'm often one of the only people of color in the room, if not the only and and often the only black person in the room. Right. Whether I'm serving on the board or whether I'm, um, you know, I'm um, the executive director in the room. And so that's where I had the aha. I was like, the, you know, um, first of all, we need to have more Black leaders um, serving in nonprofit organizations because they're often, like I mentioned before, um, serving the most marginalized, so often people of color and the people making decisions about what happens in communities of Black and Brown people are often yeah. Right. Um, and so that's where the decisions are made. That's where the seat of power is. And we really need to have more black executive leaders, people of color in general, of course. But my yeah. passion is around developing black leaders. And my uh, new mission is liberation through leadership. I love it. I love the idea of the academy. And I'm excited to see that come to fruition. Tell me a little bit about where you think we are right now in terms of that. I mean, it's a moment where I feel like a lot of those issues got a lot of focus, you know, that summer of 2020, when a lot of the social justice issues, and we really focused on trying to kind of highlight these issues. And I felt like companies made promises. I just would be curious to kind of see where, where you think we're getting. Yeah, thank you for that. It is a challenge. I yeah. spent all of those years really. I re I pivoted because I was mm -hmm. doing a lot of in person work and lost all of my clients. So I really pivoted and had been doing racial equity, cultural competency from way back. Diversity training. I had created assessments and was working with organizations. So I got re engaged in that work, and so I was working with schools and nonprofits 
who were really wanting to shift and make a difference. I even worked with a PTSA who, who you know, that social unrest made them realize like, oh, wait a minute, we're, we, we're missing some things here. We have some gaps. Mm -hmm. It's really challenging work to do. I think that's the, that's the thing. And, um, and what I realized and where I, I steered towards, um, as I was, um, working with these organizations and trying to help them, they wanted to teach their staff how to, um, you know, how uh, about unconscious bias and all these different topics mm -hmm. related to it. And I realized the place to start is actually leadership. Um, right. and so I started working with and training leaders on how to create uh, um, the racial, racially equi equitable, anti-racist um, organizations and work environments. And I think that's really the place to go. If your leadership is not ready, you're bringing in someone from the outside, training any, everyone, and then that person goes away, um, then it sort of falls apart because it's not integrated into the fabric of the organization. And right. so I really believe in training leaders, spending a considerable amount of time with them, developing their skills, helping them get comfortable on leading that work together as a, as a leadership team, not one person, not one department, um, and not an outside consultant. The outside consultant is important because it's essential that you have someone who can come in and really speak the truth about what's happening, what they're seeing, and it can do an assessment without right. having backlash, right, from coworkers or whatever. No, and I mean, I think they can yeah. operate as a, maybe a catalyst for the moment. Absolutely. But I think you're hitting on a really, really key point, which is when diversity planning is siloed, it will ultimately fail in an organization. And unless the leadership team, really the whole C-suite embraces it and essentially designs it into the core of the company. If you don't have that, it's really just, you know, frosting, you know, it's just kind of, you know, it sounds nice, but I don't see enough change. I've, you know, I would say it's quite fascinating for me. We work with a lot of companies, you know, all around the world, and there are some profound things happening right now. I mean, where companies really are just changing the way they do business completely around offering a much more diverse kind of enterprise, but also really not only from the way that they lead, but all the way through to the services and products they deliver, the way they deal with their customers and participate in the communities, the way they make things. It's just fascinating. And I can only see this being something that will continue going forward. And certainly efforts like the one that you and the Academy are doing are going to be great, great steps forward there for sure. But I mean, one of the things that you touched upon was that you are sitting on the shoulders of your ancestors, your family. And I'd be remiss to kind of try to understand really where the passion comes from for what you do, Lawan. I mean, these are big change roles. What drives you? That is what drives me. I mean, I tell the story a lot of my mother when I'm doing the racial equity work. Um, when my mother was 12 years old, she started, my parents grew up in Jim Crow. My mother mm. grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the, the massacre of Black Wall Street happened. My father grew up in a little town in Texas. And so um, my mother it was, you know, wicked smart woman. You know, she mm -hmm. served, she, she put herself through college. The only black college she could go to uh, was a black college, Langston University. And she was a chemistry major. She had a degree in chemistry. And so, but there were no scientist roles for her at that time, mm -hmm. right? And so one of the things she told, the story she tells when she was 12 years old, she decided she was gonna stop, uh, defy Jim Crow laws. She started sitting in the front of the bus. This was long before Rosa Parks. She decided she was she would go into restaurants and drag her younger sister and sit at the counter. And she said the waitress would say, "You know, I can't serve you, honey." You know, and so mm -hmm. she'd get kicked out. And she would go in white restrooms and she'd drink from white um, water fountains. And she was certain that she would die before her 18th birthday. She was certain that she would never live to see her 18th birthday. Mm. And so she did pass away a couple years ago, set a, a 70 years after the, uh, she started defying those Jim Crow laws. She was 82 wow. years old. And so that 
really resonates with me. And so I, I have to say, so when that social unrest was happening and I was thinking about going out to, to protest and I was concerned because, you know, there was some violence happening. And at the yeah. time I was living in Arizona, my 80 year old mother grabbed my hand and she said, Lawana, some things you have to be willing to die for. Yeah. yeah. Even then at 80 years old, she felt like that going out and protest now you have to be willing to die and so um that's what fuels me the passion knowing that what my parents went through knowing that they couldn't always realize their vision and goals for themselves because maybe those opportunities weren't there for them but i'm really fortunate that i've had the opportunity to uh, traverse my career in a way where i've been able to most of the time show up authentically um, and and had really the privilege of being able to choose positions that I can show show up authentically in and then um, also being able to show up unapologetically black. And I think yeah. I've gotten there in more recent years. You know, some of my friends would probably say I've always been there, but that's really important to me. And I mm -hmm. want to be able to help people um, not just, you know, Black leaders in terms of helping them understand and building their skills so that they know how to lead an effective and healthy nonprofit organization and build one. Um, but I also spend a lot of time training and working with other folks. It's not to say right. that I wouldn't train, you know, other folks, but I'm really at this time in my career, my life, I really want to shift and transform and um, you know, I'm a social change agent at heart. And so I really want to make a, a um, a concerted effort in helping um, develop Black leaders, um, yeah. help create a space where everyone can benefit from having diverse leadership. I love it. And I think you're hitting on something that will have a huge, huge impact on society. And I'm hoping to hear more about what you're working on and how it comes together next year. But with that in mind, you know, 2024 is right around the corner here, Luana. Tell me yeah. a little bit about what's on the docket for you and, and also just kind of what your take is on next year. You know, next year's a it's a big year. It's a, an it Olympic is. year. It's an yeah. election year. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's a lot of things happening. What's mm -hmm. your thought about it? Thank you. Um well, you know, for me, I'm going to start, I'm starting in early, early in the year and doing key informant interviews. I'll be interviewing um, more seasoned executive um, directors, Black executive directors to learn from them about what they wish they would have had and, and mm. what they have wish they learn and what they think is needed um, so that I can help build out um, the curriculum that I, you know, I have, I've put together, but to just check that. Um, I will, for me personally, um, I'm, um, work, I'm working on my doctorate degree, so I'll be uh, finishing that out next fall and doing my uh, prelim, prelim defense. Congratulations. From one former doctorate student yes, to yes. one that's going through it now, it's, uh, yes. it's an achievement. So Absolutely. it's a big Absolutely. one. Absolutely. And I think um, we... You know, with this um, Leadership Academy, it's more than just the Learning Academy. It's actually we'll utilize mentors to help support people in their new roles and to build community. I think that's a really important part of, of what is needed. You know, mm -hmm. you know, probably as a, as a CEO, it's, it can be an isolating um, position unless you're really, you know, um, you have a network or a group of folks that um, understand the job that and the role that you carry. And as far as, you know, 2024 being a big year, I think we're going to have to have figure out ways to, um, to shift um, mm. the shift sort of the, the culture. I mean, we, we, we need a pendulum swing, <laughs> right? right? We, we were, uh, we have, um, we have entered, we entered into an age where there's a lot of disparate, right, and di different um, viewpoints. I think we, yeah. we, um, the underbelly of sort of racism and sexism and all of the isms have um, um, risen to the surface. And I think we really have to figure out how we see our way through that muck um, yeah. and learn how to um, come together and be united. And I think folks who are not on that sort of far right, we need to engage together. We need to connect. We need to protest. We need to push back and fight um, sort of all of this vitriol that is happening around yeah. 
people being different. I think that's a that's a really important um, um, that's a really important goal for us to to focus on next year and beyond. I love that, Luana. If someone wanted to learn more about the academy, as well as all the other things that Luana Johnson Leadership and Development Group are working on, where's the best place to find you? I think the best place is on LinkedIn, uh, Luana Johnson, and also um, LuanaJohnson.com, uh, my website. Those are probably the best places to to reach me. And uh, thank you, Ben. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you so much for being on the Uncaged show today. We've been speaking with Luana Johnson. She is the founder and principal of Luana Johnson Leadership and Development Group. And we've been talking, really, probably no surprise with the, it being in the title, leadership. And really, I'd say working with leaders of all types and trying to find ways to give them the capabilities, the skills to push forward and to take on major leadership roles, big leadership roles, even board roles, and think about the skills that they need in those areas. Luana, thank you so much for being on Uncaged today, and we look forward to having you back. You're welcome. And thank you, Ben.